Um, we're continuing, continuing our discussion of the uh, Sharia system. And like we mentioned at, before our break, there are four sources of authority that go into the formation of the Sharia system. First is the Quran, then the Hadith, the traditions, which describe the way Muhammad did things. Giyas is the art of analogy, which is applied to areas where the Quran and the traditions do not specifically speak. And then there is the Ijma, which means consensus. Those are the four streams that come together in the formation of the Sharia system. And the formation of the system itself is the process of ijtihad, which is done by the ulama. The ulama are the wise theologians, and ijtihad means wisdom that comes from profound understanding on how to apply these principles and laws to everyday life, ijtihad. And in order for a person to be able to do this, you need to have the gift of fiqh, which basically means wisdom and insight based upon knowledge. Wisdom and insight based upon knowledge. So this is not every Joe that can be involved in this process. There's certain persons are recognized as being possessors of fiqh, and they become the ulama who work at the process of ijtihad. And so as we mentioned, within 200 years of Muhammad's death, the hadith system was completed. In the uh, common era, this would be about 800 AD. And uh, Bukhari and, uh, is one of the leading um, uh, figures in pulling together the Hadith system. Um, uh, Musmani is another one. Um, but Bukhari probably rates as, as the, most, uh, the most credible system. Although others, the, 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 the Musmani tradition is also very, very significant. Now, so for the next 200 years after the Hadith have been organized, the process goes on now of forming Sharia. And by 1000 AD, the Sharia systems are in place, have been completed. And they are also voluminous. Here's where we come to the analogy to the Talmud. The Talmud took about 300 years of effort to form, first of all in Galilee and then in Babylonia. And um, it's voluminous, the Talmud, you know. And it draws upon the Torah, and upon the traditions of the rabbis. So just, not just as, but similarly, uh, the way the Jews worked based upon Torah and the traditions of the rabbis at forming the Talmud, within the Muslim movement, it is the formation of the Sharia. And again, drawing upon the traditions about Muhammad and the Quranic authority, pulling all those streams together, uh, they formed the Sharia system, which is somewhat analogous to the Talmud in the, Jewish, in, the Jewish, in the Jewish system. And again, as I say, voluminous. People can spend lifetimes uh, studying this voluminous Sharia. There were, four, there were four systems of Sharia that developed within the Sunni movement, um, the, um, the um, Hanafi, and the uh, Maliki, and the uh, Shafi'i, and the Hanbali, these four systems of law. And all are respected. Um, in a dialogue with a Muslim theologian in, in um, Germany a couple years ago, she was commenting how that within Germany um, you have these four systems of law and they will worship together in the same mosque without any, um, any um, dissension. But you always know who is following which system of law <laughs> because there's little nuances of differences. <laughs> Maybe within the one system of law, the men never shake the hands of a woman. I don't know. I'm just saying, for example, another system of law, it's okay to shake your hands with a woman, but you must do ablutions after it, so forth, you know. So you have these little nuances that come through. So we know, yeah, here's Hanbali and here's Shafi. <laughs> but, uh, but they relate to each other respectfully uh, within these different systems of law. Now with the Shia, they have three systems. So there's a total of seven systems of law, three with the Shia and... Um, and uh, four with the, um, with the um, Sunnis. <laughs> now, ladies and gentlemen, for the Sunnis, after the systems of law had been completed, 1000 AD, that's a thousand years ago, the ulama determined 
that the door of its jihad is now closed. Wow. Why is the door of its jihad now closed? Ah, it's because of the doctrine of bidah. Bidah is the doctrine that there can be no change or innovation. Where does it come from? Well, the understanding of Revelation and this mother of the book in heaven, which is unchangeable, eternal. It's Islam. It's God's guidance and what you should believe and what you should do. And his guidance never changes. So all that Muhammad did was to just bring clarification in regards to the Islam that God sent down to Adam first of all. No change. It's the same Islam. God doesn't change. His law doesn't change, you see. And so to try to change the laws of God is bidah, innovation, change. You'll go to hell for that. So that theology of bidah, no innovation or change, means that for the Sunni, once the Sharia system is in place, there can be no <laughs> change to the Sharia. Imagine in Russia, if the laws of the land had been written a thousand years ago. Can you just imagine you know, the challenges and whatnot and whatnot, you know? The Constitution might be a thousand years old, but even the Constitution, we often have decisions to write a new Constitution. Different countries do that, you see. But, um, but the work of the ulama now is never ever to tamper with the Sharia. I mean, that is set in country, the Sharia. Rather, it is to work at applying the Sharia to the present situation. But it's the same law, without change, no bidah. With the Shia, it's different, and we're going to talk about the Shia in our next session. With the Shia, it's different. For them, the door of Ijtihad has never been closed. Why? Because the Shia believe that the Imam, who is the head of the community, is the incarnation of Quranic authority. And so he can bring about innovation, change, you see. So the Shia are not locked in the system the way the Sunni are. But uh, with the Sunni, this Bidah doctrine means that the door of Ishtihad is now closed. And this brings enormous tensions into the world Muslim movement. Right now in Turkey, for example, there is a cluster of Muslim theologians who are saying the door for Ishtihad must be opened again. You say, what? That's heresy. That's bidah. No, they say, we live in the 21st century. The door for its jihad must be opened. We must be able to write Islamic law for the 21st century. <gasps> bidah, bidah. You see <coughs> the struggle, the tensions? It has contributed to, to civil wars. Algeria, the horrible conflagration that killed some 50,000 people. Uh, here just a little over a decade ago. What was it all about? Well, you had this movement in Algeria that said, we want to be true Muslims. And that means applying Sharia law without change or innovation, you know. So you had this Islamist party. And then you have the uh, secularist party said, no, 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 no. We don't want to submit to Sharia law. We live in the 21st century. We want to be modern Muslims. And um, so the election happened. And which party won the election? The Islamists won the election, you see. And uh, yet the, the party in power at that point were, 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 were the more secularist party. And so the, the, the secularists just simply said the election doesn't count. <laughs> just by fiat said it's null and void. And so, uh, so this conflict took place. And um, it, it, it still percolates beneath the surface. And how do you, how do you, how do you live in the 21st century with laws, systems of law, not just a law, but systems that were developed a thousand years ago. And when it is bida to suggest introducing innovation into those systems, 
it is an enormous challenge that modern day Islam faces. And um, I say this very gently, but I think that one of the reasons for the growing interest in Jesus Christ and the church and the gospel in many regions of the Muslim world today, uh, including uh, many parts of Central Asia, is simply, <sighs> you know, do we meet a law which in Christ, which is born of the Holy Spirit, and the law is love? <laughs> it's just so free, you know. We're not entrapped in legal systems that go back a thousand years. We are committed to the law of Christ, which is love. And that law applies to every culture, everywhere, and, 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 and provides the opportunity for enormous flexibility. You know? I think you had your hand. Don't Jews uh, face the same challenge because they have Torah, and Torah was written thousands of years ago, and life changes. And why it's different with the Sharia? Uh, because Jews didn't divide within themselves, and Muslims did divide about the Sharia. Why is it different? Well, that, that's a very, a very interesting observation. And, uh, and Jews live with the same tension. Yeah. They live with the same tension. I mean, Israel is constitutionally a, um, an Orthodox state, Orthodox Jewish state, which means it submits to the Talmud and the Torah in its fullness without change. That's, 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 uh, that's officially the position of, of, of Israel, constitutionally. But practically, Israel is a secular state. You know, the vast majority of Israelis pay no attention to the Torah at all. You see? Um, just as is true of the vast majority of Muslims in many parts of the world are secular. Yes, they're Muslims, they're devout Muslims but they want nothing to do with the Sharia system. Yes? But I mean, if it's say, similar with the Shia and uh, Sunni, the Shia and Sunni, it'll be like a Pharisees and Sadducees in, in the uh, Jewish world. It will be different movements, right? It would be that you know, there's a Sadducees and the Pharisees. Would that be similar to? That's, that's interesting. Uh, the, the Sadducees, of course, were very... Um, Secularist, um, the Pharisees were like folk religion. Uh, I think maybe the analogy would, would, would apply more to folk religion within Islam, which would be the Pharisees sort of thing, they'd be the angels and spirits and so forth. Um, and the Sadducees would be more like the secularist Muslims who are very interested in Western philosophy and that kind of thing, you know. And they're, they're Muslim, but, um, but they're not impressed with these Sharia systems. Yeah. There would be analogies here. But I don't think I would apply it to Shia Sunni, more to folk religion and, and uh, more philosophical approaches. Good. Um, now, what about the church in the midst of all of this? Um, as I see it, like I said a minute, moment ago, one of the gifts the gospel offers within this debate is another way. A way which is committed to the universal law of Christ. That law is the law of love. And a Sharia, when I lived in Somalia, I never forget the evening when a couple of Somalis who just become believers in Jesus came to my office. And he says, now what is the Christian Sharia? We want to be taught the Christian Sharia. Well, I said, I guess it would be best described in the Sermon on the Mount, three chapters in the Bible, just describing how we should relate even to our enemies and so forth. And it is the Holy Spirit within us that imprints this law upon our being. And so we live according to the law of Christ through the empowerment and transforming work of the Holy Spirit. This passage we read in Corinthians this morning, Corinthians 2, you know, you are the letter from heaven which the Spirit has imprinted, for the Spirit has imprinted upon your souls this letter. What is this letter? It's the law of Christ, he says. It's, the, it's Christ who's imprinted upon us. And so the Holy Spirit, you see, Muslims talk about the Sharia being the path to the watering hole. We bear witness the Holy Spirit is that life, you see. And when we believe, we are within the path 
you see. Jesus is the way, we're within the path, and the Holy Spirit uh, provides for us water. Jesus said, uh, you remember John chapter 6, that he who believes in me out of his innermost being will flow rivers of living water. By this he means the Holy Spirit. And so as we believe in him, this water of life flows within us. And it's not a, 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 a life which is bound by, by, uh, by uh, multitudinous laws where you have to spend a lifetime if, if you're serious, you know, just studying this stuff. It's, it's this gift of life which even the most simple, the educated among us can participate in fully, you see. The life of the Holy Spirit. Yes, come in. It's similar to under the Sharia, those states will be, or try to imply this law, will be similar like to Mosaic law, it would be like a theocracy in a theocracy and where some law would be like a kill adulterers or cut the hand or something. Oh, exactly, so exactly. That would be very similar probably to the Old Testament. Exactly, exactly, exactly. When you look at the Sharia laws and you, you look at the Mosaic laws, uh, there's, there's, the, there's, there's been, I feel, a lot of cross-fertilization. Um, a scholar, Dudley Woodbury from Fuller Seminary, made a comment here some time ago that about 80% of Islamic civil law is very similar to Jewish civil law. You know, uh, Remember, Muhammad certainly wanted this Muslim movement to be in continuity and in transformational continuity with Judaism. If that, and, and, in many ways, that's exactly what happened. But, um, but you read the Old Testament, you stone at altars. Well, you know, thank God it's not often done, but, but um, you know, the letter of the Sharia is the same thing. You see? Which is why people say, in the modern world, we, we, we need a different system of law. You know, although many Muslims say we really want Sharia to apply to our experience uh, in reality, there's very few Muslim societies that practice Sharia to in its, in its full, fullest ex expression. Uh, very few states do. Uh, Iran and, and Saudi Arabia. Where else? Maybe a few others. But, um, but um, I remember when I was uh, in London having those dialogues with the Muslim Student Association. We're in the airport going, going now after our, our week together. And they were saying to me, as you see, David, England needs Sharia law. It would redeem England from this decadence of uh, decadent civilization, which is spinning out of control. It needs Sharia law. No, I said, England does not need Sharia law. <laughs> Look, wherever Sharia law is applied, how Christians are pushed into a demi status and their rights are circumscribed. Christians are never happy about Sharia systems. Look what's happening in Nigeria right now. Oh, no, Christians love Sharia. I said, they don't. So the dialogue is going on within the car very vigorously as we're going to the airport. England needs Sharia law. And then there was a period of silence. And then the Muslim friend who was just a few minutes earlier shouting the loudest that England needs Sharia law, he says, my Muslim brothers, if we're really honest with each other, we agree with Dr. Shank. Why are we flying to Canada tonight and not to Pakistan? He says, it's because we love the freedoms of the West. That's why we're going to Canada. We agree with him. <laughs> and I thought, I thought in the car that night was a microcosmic, a, a, a mini revelation of the global debate within Islam, you see. And of course, although I say that you don't have Muslim states applying city law, um, at least not very many of them, few, very few, um, still, Sharia is is uh, is uh, does does form certain areas of life. For example, domestic law, divorce laws, and so forth are very much informed by Sharia law. So it's not as if as if a country decides not to adopt Sharia as the law of the land, um, and 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 therefore has nothing to do with it. It may decide let's not make Sharia the law of the land, but um, still you have your Qadi courts which relate to, particularly to domestic law, uh, family life, inheritance laws, and so forth, may be very well informed by Sharia law, but not take the whole thing, not take the whole thing. That can happen. And that's what happens in most Muslim states. You have two tracks. You have the Sharia tract for domestic law and so forth, and then you have the, uh, the, uh, 
the federal law, which uh, is much more formed by uh, Western systems of law, you track. But as I say, it's a tension within the soul of Islam. And I believe, I conf this is my confession as a follower of Jesus, I believe Christ offers a wonderful gift within the midst of it all, not to be immune and independent of law, but it is the law of Christ, which is the law of love, which is extremely freeing and extremely relevant. It's a very interesting time, a very sobering time, a very serious time, uh, a very important time. And um, I think as, as, as followers of Jesus, we don't sort of stand back with glee at the problem and challenges that our Muslim friends experience in working through all of this, but we do offer a word of witness that in Jesus, we have found a freedom uh, which is very precious, but it's not a freedom which leads to anarchy. It is a freedom which empowers us to love as Jesus loved, and that's good news. That's good news, the law of Christ. And this has to do then, of course, with our approaches to mission. TVS is a nonprofit project. Our joint effort will bring about the common purpose of making Christian education available around the world and developing good Christian servant leaders. You have a unique opportunity to partner in this effort through your prayer and or financial support of TVS ministry. For more information, please visit www.tvseminary.com. Within, within the, um, within the Islamic understanding, here is the non-Islamic world, let's say, but here is the Ummah, the Muslim Ummah, and ideally, <laughs> devout Muslims would say, ideally, it submits to the Sharia system. That's the tug, it's always the tug. Move in the direction of the Sharia, move in the direction of the Sharia, that tug. Which means if someone becomes a Muslim, a process is instituted whereby he migrates from his traditional culture, his original culture, into the Islamic culture the parameters of which are very much determined by Sharia. So there's a movement from one culture to another. We call this in theology, proselytizing. He becomes a proselyte. Moving from one culture into another. One of the touchstones of that proselytizing process is Arabization. Remember, the cordon is in Arabic. You're that old man in Baltimore I told you about the other day comes to the mosque, I want to become a Muslim. The Imam says, you must therefore learn Arabic because Salat is in Arabic. And so the, it, is, it is a Sharia defined culture in many ways, which is idealized, and it is a culture which is Arabized. Um, so you move into this new cultural system. You become a proselyte. Now within the Christian movement, sometimes we also work proselytizingly, but that's not New Testament. In the New Testament understanding, we speak not about proselytizing, but about conversion. Conversion. And what is conversion? Conversion is to turn our hearts towards Jesus Christ. He becomes the center, you see. And Jesus Christ is incarnated within a culture, you see. He challenged Jewish culture, but he never left it. He always was Jewish, you see. Even Paul, after he met Christ, he remained Jewish, you see. And Paul fought for the right of Gentile Christians to remain Gentile. Acts chapter 15, the Jerusalem Conference. The Jerusalem Conference is all about that where many Gentiles are becoming believers in Christ now, do they need to become proselytes? Oh yes, the, Jews is, the Jewish leaders in Jerusalem said, yes, they must become proselytes. They must move from Gentile culture into Jewish culture. They must be circumcised, they must stop eating pork, whatnot and whatnot. They must change cultures now when they become Christians. And uh, so they had this huge conference in, in Jerusalem. What did they decide? No, we will not be, you cannot overstate the significance of this. We will not become a proselytizing movement. If a Muslim 
or Muslims here in Kursk become believers in Jesus, they don't need to shift to begin to worship as they say the Russian God, you see, and become Russians. No, they can remain within their own culture. That's God's intention. So we're not a proselytizing movement. We don't say shift from, from one culture to another. No, no, no. Stay within your culture. So when someone believes, Christ becomes the center of his life and commitment within his culture. He doesn't move into the new culture. Suppose a Russian believer in Christ shares the gospel with a Muslim from, uh, from Afghanistan here in this town. And there's a group of Afghanistanis living here. And uh, so a group become believers in Christ. Um, do they need to shift now into a Russian church? No. You see, they don't need to. They can remain within their culture committed to Jesus Christ a converting movement, you see. And so that's, that's the nature of the Christian movement. And it's one reason, of course, that the church grows so rapidly all over the world. Wow! You can believe in Jesus and embrace him and stay in your culture. And Sunday morning you can worship in your own language. You don't have to worship in Greek or Russian or something like that. You can wor worship in your own native language, you see. What happens is Jesus becomes the center, but, you re but he becomes incarnated within that culture. Yeah. You just cannot overstate the significance of Acts 15, which means the Christian movement is a converting movement, not a proselytizing movement. And believe you me, that is a major, major watershed and also enormously challenging as one thinks of uh, Muslim communities of believers in Jesus developing all over the world. You know, they remain within their culture. What does that mean? Can you keep going to the mosque? Or is that not possible? It's a question that they work with. And uh, we're not going to answer it here in this little circle. Um, uh, do they need to leave the mosque? Some say, yes, we must leave the mosque. Others say, well, um, <laughs> maybe we could participate in the mosque worship and have a fellowship of believers in Jesus. You see, those sorts of questions um, believers within Muslim context struggle with all over the world today. And it's a very challenging and exhilarating time because all over the world you have these fellowships developing of believers in Christ. And I think one of the reasons is the freedom we have in Christ. It's extremely attractive. The law is the law of love. Christ is the center. But, um, but it's not a proselytizing movement. Not a proselytizing movement. You don't need to, uh, to um, join a new culture to become a follower of Jesus Christ. <laughs> Jesus becomes incarnated within the local culture and he transforms it from within. There is a Sharia in the Christian movement, and the Sharia is the fullness of the Holy Spirit. And walk with the Holy Spirit. David, and what does the Holy Spirit do? He points us to Christ, the centrality of Christ. But that's enormously free, enormously free. Like there's dear Muslim friends in that car going to the airport at Heathrow. You know, if we're honest, we agree with Shank. We love the freedoms he's talking about. And at the same time, one of them said, you know, David, for me to become a Christian would be very, very free. Very, very free, you see. Freeing from what? Freeing from this Sharia business, you see. It's very freeing. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10-11 How to give to TVS Ministry You may give online at efta.org slash give now in the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota.
or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.